Now there's a lot of cars out there that claim to be the king, but this is the one. This is the car for me that holds the throne. King 32, the R32 GDR that has set so many world records. It's been on the world stage so often, and I'm lucky enough to have it in the studio today to be able to open the hood, get under the back of it, and see what makes this thing tick from front to back. Now, it's a little bit unusual that I'd get the chance to do that because this thing is normally at the workshop or it's at the racetrack racing. And we all know that when it's at the racetrack, you don't really sort of want to wander up and be poking around and looking and asking questions. So today, I've got it here all by myself. I can go through the engine bay, see what's in the front there, have a look under the rear end and understand what makes this thing tick. So back when this car started racing, a 1,000 horsepower four-wheel drive R32 GTR was a rarity. Running an eight-second pass in an R32 GTR was a rarity. And this thing was on the forefront, on the cutting edge of technology. And as time's gone on, and mind you, it's only been over the last sort of 10 or 12 years or so, this car has reset and reset and reset records. And now I'm sitting right next to an R32 GTR Skyline that runs mid sixes. That's right, this thing has run a best time of 662. Can you believe it? And what's even more impressive is that there's still a full chassis under this car. It's not all cut up with tubes, that's it. It's using the R32 chassis, <laughs> 662, 209 mile an hour. It's absolutely phenomenal how far these guys have come with this car. It, it's remarkable, it's impressive that the car can actually do it, remembering R32, 1989-ish model car. And it's not just the chassis that makes this car special. It's got factory glass, it's got power windows, it's got central locking, it's got power steering. It's got a whole bunch of those creature comforts that you expect in a regular car. It just so happens that this thing goes over 200 mile an hour in the quarter. So on today's Anatomy of Speed, I get to look at King 32 with all its covers off. I've spoken to Nader Nader, who owns the car. I've spoken to Anthony Matuk of Matuk's Racing, and both of them have said, you know what? Open the bonnet, show everything, there's no secrets. This thing runs sixes, it's the king, and they're gonna keep on pushing to make sure that it stays the king. So back in 1989, this thing would have had a cast iron block and it would have been a 2.6 litre six cylinder engine. Now this one, while it looks fairly similar, it's actually got a billet aluminium block, a 3.2 litre capacity. Now that block is supplied by billet bullet engines. Then the Matux guys fit the rotating assembly in there, the crank, the rods, the pistons. They've got a factory cast aluminium cylinder head so we're still using the factory cast cylinder head, but it's been through the Matux Racing CNC port program, which means that it opens the intake and the exhaust up all the way so that it can achieve these huge horsepower figures. It's got a set of Matux Racing camshafts, so a custom grind on the camshafts. The cylinder head's also been machined to fit a huge set of intake and exhaust valves in order to flow enough air to make that much power, as well as having some heavy duty valve springs and retainers. Um, one of the interesting things about this, if you call the guys at Matux, it's absolutely no problem at all to simply purchase one of these cylinder heads. So while yes, the development has been done on cars like this on their other race cars, you can ring up, you can purchase this whole engine or just a cylinder head to put onto your 2000 horsepower street car. Starting on the hot side, in case you hadn't already noticed, this thing is turbocharged. It's got a precision turbocharger. It's got a ginormous compressor wheel on the front here. So this range of precision turbochargers have compressor wheels somewhere between about 90 and 115 millimeters. So depending on, on your application is which compressor wheel you buy. It's got a five inch dump pipe off the back here. It's got a Haltech NTK wideband sensor. Then 
down on the front here, it's got a 60 millimeter Turbo Smart wastegate that's got a two and a half inch dump pipe straight down. The wastegate for this turbocharger has got a two and a half inch dump pipe. <laughs> that's the same size as a dump pipe on a lot of factory turbo cars. In order to control boost pressure through this turbocharger and wastegate, we've got the Haltex CO2 boost control system. So the solenoid blocks over here. Admittedly, we're not wasting too many exhaust gases on this engine package. The wastegate is used to do some torque management stuff off the line so we can leave at a slightly lower boost pressure than the 70 pounds that it runs in the top end of the track. And while the thing's making 70 pounds of boost pressure, it's really important to be looking at the exhaust back pressure as well. So there's a sensor fitting just down here in the turbine housing, a coil that comes up to cool that exhaust down a little bit before it runs up and across to the other side to the pressure sensor. The guys tell me that this thing's got about one to one, meaning that if we've got 70 pounds of intake pressure, we've also got about 70 pounds of exhaust back pressure for this particular combination. So working in conjunction with that exhaust back pressure sensor, we've also got our manifold pressure sensor, as well as this sensor just under here, which is our wastegate hat pressure sensor. This is the sensor that we use to determine the pressure in the wastegate hat, then to regulate the CO2 boost control solenoids, thus regulating the boost pressure in the intake manifold. Also in this corner, we've got our six boost exhaust manifold. It's got six EGTs in there, so we can measure the individual exhaust gas temperature of each cylinder. They come around here to a Haltec thermocouple amplifier that's mounted in the corner. But what's interesting about here as well, I'm just noticing the factory firewall, the factory strut top, the factory guards here. None of this stuff's been cut out and sheet metaled. This is all factory R32 GTR. It's absolutely incredible how much car it still is here in the front. It's really impressive. Now this engine wouldn't have much hope in hell of making 2000 horsepower if it didn't have a dry sump. Hell, the RB engine didn't really have much hope of making 200 horsepower consistently on the factory oiling system. So this thing has got a full dry sump set up down the front with the dry sump pump mounted on this side of the block. We've got our breathers that come along the top here into this bulkhead fitting. Then we've got our full dry sump tank at the front here, which is the thing where we pour the oil, where we check the oil. Then we've also got a spew line, we call it, that goes back up this line to a spew tank in the back of the car. That's handling any blow by or any overflow from the engine during a run. Towards the center of the engine bay, we've got our Tomei branded Vernier cam gears up the top that intake cam gear dialed in right on zero. I'm not sure what to take away from that, but it is interesting. We've got a trigger system on the front here. So Matooks actually build these trigger systems in-house on their CNC machine. Down the bottom, it's got 12 teeth that are spaced equally, and it's got a cherry red sensor down the bottom that's detecting those 12 teeth. Up the top here, we've got another cherry red sensor, and that's looking at a single tooth up there. Now remembering being a four stroke engine that the crankshaft spins two times to the camshafts one time, that means that we see 12 teeth two times. So 24 teeth, then we see a single tooth on the cam, which is our reset signal. We know that all six cylinders have pushed through the cycle and this thing tells the engine management system when to reset and start to fire coil number one again. And in this case, GTR coils. Nissan R35 GTR coils, to be precise. Now, this car is running 660s over 200 mile an hour, doing lap after lap after lap. It's got factory R35 coils in it. Now, that is a heavily over-engineered coil. But for us car guys, absolute blessing. In order to supply enough fuel to the engine in order to make the horsepower, it's got a mechanical fuel pump that's bolted onto the back of the belt-driven oil pump. Now that's driven off the nose of the crankshaft, so when we crank the engine, that fuel pump starts to turn, starts to build pressure, and the engine will eventually start and run. So as a trick to get the fuel pressure up without having to crank over the mechanical fuel pump, the guys have got a Bosch 044 fuel pump as well. As soon as we hit the starter, that electric fuel pump primes up, it back feeds the fuel pressure regulator in order to get fuel pressure in the rails, which means the engine can start and run thus turning the mechanical fuel pump, which then takes over and the electric fuel pump will turn off. So that's a really nice aid to get the thing up and running so you don't have to see, spray some 
some aero start or some starter fluid or whatever in through the turbocharger to get the thing to actually run. Across the front of the engine bay here, again, amazing. It's got a factory R32 radiator support. Uh, it doesn't have a factory R32 radiator. It's got a smaller aluminium radiator because as this thing's running, you are gonna build pressure in the cooling system. A factory radiator would probably explode at the levels that this thing would see on a big pass. And when something does go wrong, we don't want the radiator to be able to pressurize and explode. That'd be a big problem. So having an aluminum radiator like this is a safety thing, but it's also cooling the engine. You can see here on the front of the turbocharger, we don't have an air filter, but when this thing spins, it compresses the air, pushes it down the front through the absolutely ginormous Plasma Man Pro Series inner cooler. The thing is this wide. Um, it's an air to air intercooler, which the air pushes through, then comes up into the Hypertune throttle body and the Hypertune plenum. Now let's get over that side and we'll count how many injectors the thing's got. 18. That's how many injectors it's got across the top. It's got Siemens Decker injectors and it's got three stages of six injectors. So it's got six primary injectors, six secondary injectors, and six tertiary injectors. Three Siemens Deckers or three 2400cc injectors per cylinder. But when we say 2400cc, that's not quite the whole story because the flow rate of the injector also depends on the fuel pressure. Now, this thing's got an aeromotive fuel pressure regulator down here that runs a base of 60 pounds. So at a base of 60 pounds of fuel pressure, these things are making roughly 2,300 cc per injector. So we've got three, 2,300 times three per cylinder. And that is how you make over 2,000 horsepower. Plenty of fuel pump, plenty of injector, and plenty of turbo. Those 18 injectors are sharing these two fuel rails just here. So we've got the primary fuel rail down the front houses the six primary injectors. Then the secondaries and tertiaries are into this second fuel rail up the top here. And they're all fed from that mechanical fuel pump on the other side. Comes down across here to the fuel pressure regulator, then back to the tank. Now, what type of fuel is this thing on? Well, it gets raced on methanol. And then for street duties or driving around the track or whatever the case, it's on E85. Once all that boosted air has made its way through that massive Plasma Man air-to-air -air inner cooler, it comes up through the intake pipe, and then there's a K-type thermocouple mounted just there. That runs across into the K-type amplifier box. So there is eight channels in that thermocouple amplifier. Six are getting used for EGTs, and then there's one here in the intake pipe, which on a normal car, you can use a conventional air temp sensor that might read from you know, negative 40 degrees to positive 120 or positive 130 degrees Celsius. Now, with an intercooler as massive as this, I wouldn't expect intake temperatures to get that hot on a regular car, but in a car like this pumping 70 pounds of boost pressure for a full quarter mile, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the intake temps made it over 100 degrees Celsius by the end of the track at the charge pipe, which is why the guys are using a K-type thermocouple there instead of a conventional air temperature sensor. Remembering that a K-type thermocouple can read from uh, negative 200 Celsius to positive 1250 degrees Celsius. They're excellent for measuring intake temperatures, um, oil temperatures, coolant temperatures, um, even cabin temperature or engine bay temperature. So even though we kind of call them an EGT or an exhaust gas temperature sensor, um, they really are a thermocouple and a thermocouple can be used for a whole lot more than just exhaust temperatures. And to hold that kind of boost pressure, we need a serious intake plenum. So we've got a hypertune throttle body and a hypertune billet intake plenum here. This is as tough as it gets. We've got the hypertune fuel rails, really handy because they do the intake runners where we can fit the three injectors and the two fuel rails and you kind of grab it as a kit so it all bolts together, it all just works. When you've got 70 pounds of boost pressure, when you're running a car as hard as this, inevitably there's gonna be some problems. There might be a backfire every now and then. This thing will cop it. It's not gonna explode. You're not gonna have any dramas. So something a little bit clever just here, the bulkhead for the electrical connector. So this is where all the wiring goes for the whole engine, as well as the headlights, the indicators. So all that stuff is going through the Nexus engine management system. Goes up to the bulkhead here, but where the bulkhead's mounted is pretty interesting. This used to be a manual car. 
the bolt, the hole just there is where that clutch master cylinder used to come through. So that's now the electrical connector for the engine. If we unscrew that, we could pull it out. We could pop the engine out, get it on the bench and go through it. So something like this that's been pushed so hard, that's got so much horsepower, not unusual at all, to undo that bulkhead adapter, undo a couple of fittings, pull the engine out, put it on the bench, check the bearings, go through it, make sure it's nice and fresh. Might want to put some new rings in it or put a fresh set of conrods in it, then put it back together for the next race meeting. So that's the reason why we use bulkhead connectors that are quick and easy to get out compared to a street car or a, a factory car where you typically wouldn't have a connection like that and instead you would undo all the connectors individually. Moving across from the bulkhead connector, we've got the brake master cylinder. While some R32 GDRs are circuit cars, some are street cars, this one has got a brake master cylinder only. It does not have a booster because it simply doesn't need one for the kind of work that it does. It does have carbon brakes for however, so we will have a look at them in a little bit. Up the front here, the tyre that puts all that horsepower to the ground, and this thing is a 275 radial. So it's a 275 60 15. So 15 inch, it's got a bead lock, it's got some huge wheel studs, the ones on the back are even bigger. Uh, it's got our carbon brake disc behind there, but the thing that we're talking about here, yeah, is the ET Street Radial Pro tyre. So it's got the same tyres whole way around, a little bit different to a circuit car that might have slightly smaller tyres or narrower tyres at the front compared to the back. Whereas in this radial class, we need as much grip as we can get, so we use this, the biggest tyre that we're allowed to fit whole way around. So, four-wheel drive radial tyre, right there. With an engine bay as serious as what we've got up the front here, you could be excused for having a fairly sort of, you know, basic race interior, but not the case here. It's got carbon door trims, it's got a beautiful carbon dash that's mimicking the factory R32. It's got these absolutely beautiful carbon seats which have got next to no padding, but are incredibly comfortable. I don't know how you'd go for a long road trip, but as a race car, this is probably one of the most comfortable seats I've ever sat in. It's got the beautiful carbon center console. They've even continued that theme down the back, so it doesn't have any seats in it at the back, but the carbon's molded in such a way that sort of mimics what the R32 seat was. Remember how it had those two tiny little seats? Well, you couldn't sit in them in an R32, and you can't sit in the back there anyway. And then all of those colors matched in with the Haltech IC7 dash going with that sort of red, white, and black theme. It is really, really clean and beautiful in here. Even the, the hood lining is all trimmed, and it smells great in here. It's not your normal race car. Now, all that power from the engine up the front has to get to the wheels somehow, and it does that through a turbo 400 automatic transmission and through a factory center diff. That's right, an R32 GDR factory center diff. Turbo 400 gearbox, this thing is electronically, pneumatically air shifted. So what that means is that it's got a CO2 bottle over here. So that's got compressed air in it. That does the boost control as well as doing the shift strategy. So the Nexus engine management system is in control of when the gearbox shifts. So all the driver needs to do is hold it flat, launch it, hold the pedal as flat as you can hold it with 2000 horsepower, hold on. This gear shifter, it's gonna be sitting there naturally in first gear. Then it's gonna automatically shift to second and she's away. Being a four wheel drive, the Turbo 400's obviously got a drive shaft that goes to the rear diff and the rear diff is not standard like the center diff. It's actually got a full custom nine inch diff in a custom carrier in the back, but it's still full independent. So it's got a nine inch center then that comes out to some, some stub axles and some CVs that then go into some um, factory hubs on either side to make it full four-wheel drive, which is one of the really, really impressive things about this car. A six-second four-wheel drive car, that's why this car is so special. Last time I sat in this car, it was a lot more of an R32 inside. So we'll put a link to that video, the time that it had an elite 2500 ECU with a patch harness plugged into the factory loom. So I wanna say it wasn't as serious of a race car because it had the factory wiring harness, a plug-in ECU. I was lucky enough for Anthony to take me for a run in the car then, and it's one of the fastest cars I was, I've ever been in then.
So now the thing's got a Nexus R5 series ECU in control. There's no factory harness left in the car. The Nexus R5 has taken full control over the headlights, the tail lights, the indicators. Um, it's plugged directly into the IC7 dash. We've got our 15 button keypad here that goes into the Nexus ECU. Uh, it's even taken control of the, the full center diff. So the four wheel drive control and the Atessa pump is all done through the Nexus ECU. Like I was talking about before, the electronically controlled pneumatic shifting is all controlled through the Haltex automatic transmission function so that the engine management system will shift the gear when the driver's at the right throttle position, the right RPM and the right road speed. So that gets the perfect pass every time and it builds a level of safety in so that if for whatever reason the driver is at part throttle or there's a particular condition where the car shouldn't shift gears, it won't. Likewise, it has another set of conditions where the engine management system deems it safer to do a short shift, it will. The Nexus ECU in this car is controlling the boost pressure in the inlet manifold by manipulating the pressure or the CO2 pressure going to the wastegate, CO2 boost control. The way that we're doing that, when we release this button, the trans brake button, a race timer starts. So that means that we know exactly one second, two seconds, three seconds into the run we can map our boost pressure versus that race time. Likewise, this same button is also used, so that's trans brake when the car's sitting stationary. As soon as the car takes off, that button's got a second task of having a nitrous override. So the nitrous is used to bring the car up on the torque converter when we're on the trans brake. Then, once we've released that button, the car takes off, it knows that this can't be a trans brake button any longer because we've got road speed. So we can then press that button to use the nitrous again at the top end of the track if the driver deems necessary. I just touched on this, that this is the trans brake button. So basically what that's doing, when I press this button, the automatic transmission that has first gear and reverse gear engaged together, meaning that the car can't go forwards, can't go backwards. We've got our trans brake launch RPM limiter done through the engine management system. So if I hold this button, I go flat to the floor we might bounce off a rev limiter that is the launch rev limiter or the trans brake limiter that might be five, six, seven, eight thousand RPM. As soon as we let go of this button, that's when the race timer starts. That's when that reverse gear disappears. We're in first gear. We've got, I'm going to say unlimited power and you're holding on for dear life to this factory R32 GDR steering wheel. Speaking of race car stuff, up here, we've got the parachute handle. So if I pull that, two parachutes will pop out the back. R32 GTR with two parachutes, meaning that it's, it's configured to go over 200 mile an hour. That's also something that I don't think I'll say very often. Now to me, this is a really, really special car because I got to go for a ride in it all those years ago when it was a patch harness on a factory wiring harness. Now it's got the full Nexus system controlling the whole car. The interior's giving, been given a huge birthday. It's got that crazy billet engine in it now. It's got the nine inch independent rear end in it, but it's not like all of those things were just slapped in this car. It's not like the whole front was cut off and gone all tubular. The guys have kind of upgraded the parts that needed upgrading. And to me, I think that's really special because the thing's got a factory firewall. It's got a factory radiator support. It's got power windows. Like if I pull and push on here, like, it's unbelievable that this car runs 660s at 200 mile an hour, above 200 mile an hour. Like, factory center diff, there's a lot of knowledge in there because what the guys have realized is that, okay, we don't need to replace some of these parts, but when things are breaking, they've been upgrading them. So the car has just gotten faster and faster and faster through that race program, and it's unbelievable that it's got to this point where the car that I'm sitting in right now, the car that starts off the key, that same car could go and race in a Pro FX class. It could go and race against a full tube chassis car and it's absolutely got a chance. And I think that's what makes this car so special. All I know is that when Anthony and Nader turn up to pick this car up, if one of them offers me a ride in it this time with 2000 horsepower 
with all this gear. I think that this time I'll certainly smile, but this time I'll be saying no. As always, thanks very much for watching. My name's Scott. Catch you next time.